Hello, everyone. This is starting the recording for our little talk with Dr. Sridham Kui, the most amazing, amazing healthcare professional there is out there. And yeah, so I'll introduce CSA first, which is we're essentially preserving and increasing, you know, the pride and history of Khmer culture, spreading it around to uh, non Khmer students, all Khmer students, and just anyone that organizes which are like meet our general meetings each week, our big annual culture show, which has skits, performances, and free food, free Cambodian food particularly, and come through this, this February. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that is what CSA is. Um, there will be a 20-minute Q&A session by Dr. Shreyram Kui near the end, so stay in tune for that. And so my name is Carrie Lee. I am the president of CSA. And yeah, I'll pass it down to Oh, Eric. <laughs> Yo. Hello, I'm Eric. I'm the vice president of CSA. Oh, I can't tell if I was lagging there. No, you weren't. You were good. Oh, okay. And our secretary, Jean, couldn't be here. But, you know, she's in our hearts. She's here. She's here with us. And then I'll pass it to Austin. Hello, I'm Austin. I'm the treasurer of CSA. Pass it over to uh, Ella. Hello, uh, my name is Ella, and I am the junior advisor for CSA. As Eric mentioned, there are two officers who could not be here, which are Jeannie, our secretary, and Jet, our event coordinator. But as he said, they are in our hearts. They're not, they, they did not pass away. They are still alive, but they're just in our hearts. So they're doing well but they just could not be here, unfortunately, but they were very excited for this talk, for just everything about this, like what knowledge that you have. So as we go into this, I'm gonna segue it into our little, our little amazing guest here that we have, which is the first female Cambodian refugee surgeon in the US, and it is Dr. Shreyam Kui, Jom Reap Suor, Dr. Shreyam Kui. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I feel like I'm back at home because uh, Corvallis is my hometown and OSU is, is where, where it all started. So thank you. I'm very grateful to be back here. Um, uh, so thank you, Kari, Carrie, for, for inviting me here and uh, uh, to, to talk about my journey. And, uh, and um, I'll, I'll talk briefly about my, my journey in coming to the United States and, and growing up in Oregon and, and my career. And then hopefully most of the time will be spent on questions because I think that's where hopefully you can get the, the most benefit from, from this. Um, so... I was born uh, in Cambodia, in the Khmer, um, in 1978, which was during the uh, Khmer Rouge regime uh, uh, under Pol Pot's uh, regime. And I, my, my, going back a little bit, my, my family before the communist regime had been living in Phnom Penh, the capital city of, uh, of Cambodia, uh, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, and my sister. And in, um, 1975, I believe, April 1975, was when uh, the country fell to um, uh, communist uh, power. And um, uh, at that time, as many of you in, in this room, uh, in this chat room, uh, know, uh, because your own family history, uh, uh, when, when the country fell to communist uh, rule, um, most of the people were driven out of the cities and out of their homes and out of their communities into um, the jungles, into the prai, into the srei, to, to work in forced labor camps. And uh, during that time period, the, the communist Paul Pot and his the Khmer Rouge soldiers would target um, uh, any educated people, people who are doctors, teachers, lawyers, educators, artists, musicians, anyone who um, represent the, the culture and the education and the accomplishments of the Cambodian um, people. And they were tar targeted for execution. My mom um, had worked as a teacher. My dad was a, an engineer by, by training. And so their lives were in danger. And for the four years of the Khmer Rouge 
regime. They they hid their identities. They uh, did everything they could to survive and to keep my sister and, and eventually me alive. And I was born during that time in 1975, in um, uh, 1978, March 1978, in um, the area that we were in was uh, Prajka, which was um, uh, kind of one of the forested areas because we had been forced out of the, the cities. Um, and when I was about two years old, after the Khmer Rouge were overthrown, my mom made the decision to escape from Cambodia because she knew that there was no opportunity and no life um, for my sister and me there. Um, and it was still a very, very dangerous time because the, the countryside, the most of the countryside in the country was littered with landmines from the years of warfare and um, the borders were not open. Um, we uh, managed to uh, make it through the jungles and the, and the landmines and to get to the border to cross into Thailand. But when we, we got there, the the refugee camp had actually closed uh, to new refugees because they had gotten so many, hundreds of thousands of refugees. Um, and uh, luckily, I don't, I don't say luckily, I say truly, thankfully, by the grace of God, um, we were able to make it across just crawling under the barbed wire and getting into the camp um, at night. Um, and when we got there across the border in the refugee camp, we thought that we were safe, that we were finally free. Um, but about, about a week or two after we, we arrived there, um, uh, an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade landed on the um, area where we were sleeping and my mom was severely injured. Um, she was trying to protect me and my sister and she bore probably the, the most of the injuries. Um, and uh, she had massive lacerations on her abdomen and throughout her torso and her body. And uh, I had um, injuries to my head. Um, there's a, a scar that runs down here in my, my uh, left ear was uh, partly torn off um, and then scalp injuries. And then uh, along the left side of my body um, and my sister had some, some lacerations too. Um, thankfully, very grateful for this. There was a Red Cross surgeon who was volunteering there in the camp and uh, medical volunteers there. And they, they operated on me and, and so back on my ear and uh, saved my life. Um, at the time, as you probably know, during uh, warfare and during uh, conflicts, uh, there's a concept of triage where you try to save as many lives as possible. And uh, initially um, they didn't think that my mom was a survival uh, casualty. So she was put to the side while everyone else was operated on. And um, then by morning, um, when they finished operating on everyone else, they realized that she was still alive. And they operated on her, they did a laparotomy and uh, resected a lot of damaged uh, bowel and uh, uh, took care of bleeding and they were able to save her life. And so I'm extremely, extremely grateful to um, the volunteer surgeon and the volunteer uh, uh, people who they, you know, they left behind their families, they left behind their jobs, they left behind everything new, they knew to to come to this other country, to, to come to a, a squalid refugee camp and, and to help a people that didn't look like them, that didn't speak their language, that, that um, could never repay them back. And so I, I owe my life and I, my gratitude to to those people. And I'm, I'm grateful for people who had the compassion, the kindness to help in that way. And I was very young at that time. Um, but um, growing up in, in Oregon, my mom would tell us the stories about, about all these people who had helped us so much. And it's always just been uh, a part of my being, of the, just the fiber of my being. And it's always been the story of my life. So I've, um, it, it's something that's, I think, uh, motivated and driven me in what I do. Um, so we lived in about four different refugee camps uh, in Thailand and then later in the Philippines and uh, we got sponsored to the United States and uh, very grateful because uh, a lot of people didn't have that opportunity to, to leave the refugee camps. There are a lot of people who were sent back, a lot of people who died trying to escape. So I'm, I'm one of the fortunate few. And we were relocated to Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, uh, it, 
I've, I'm very grateful for the childhood I had in Corvallis. It's a wonderful place to grow up. I went to kindergarten here in Corvallis, middle school, high school at Crescent Valley, and then uh, went to Oregon State University. Um, I was a microbiology major and a philosophy major um, and grateful for both uh, those uh, different disciplines because the microbiology is the science part, which was helpful for me for getting into medical school. And, and But the philosophy, I really feel like learning about the critical thinking skills, learning to write, learning to be able to, to relay um, complex uh, 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 ideas in a, in a powerful way was hugely, hugely uh, impactful in my career in health policy and, and health leadership. So I'm very thankful for, for both sides of my education at Oregon State University, both the microbiology and the philosophy. Um, uh, I, during my senior year, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was in the EOP office and um, saw this uh, 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 notice on the wall about the Barbara Jordan Health Policy uh, Scholars Program run through the Kaiser Family Foundation. And oh my gosh, that was just a great experience. I applied to it. I was accepted. I got to spend um, several months in Washington, D.C., working in the U.S. Senate for Senator Tom Harkin. Uh, it was just an amazing, phenomenal experience. Uh, Got to work on the help write the Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act, a, a, a speech that uh, Senator Harkin gave on that. Um, got to um, work on uh, uh, going to hearings and, and writing memos about uh, the health of women and then the, about uh, uh, prescription drugs and cost and health policy issues. And it was just a, a life-changing experience to get to see um, the role that uh, people can have in making a change that that has such a huge impact over a large population. It was just truly inspiring. And, and also during that time, um, uh, I um, got to uh, meet uh, Congressman John Lewis, who was just such an inspiration and had so many great mentors. So um, then uh, after I finished that, I headed to medical school at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland. And um, uh, uh, when I started at medical school, I actually fully intended to be a family practice doctor uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that's really all I knew about medicine is, you know, the because uh, when I, I had never met any other kind of doctor. And two, I'm actually afraid of blood. So um, I, I think a lot of people find that surprising because I'm uh, I'm a surgeon today. And, and there's kind of a story behind that. Um, so I was fully planning to, to become a family medicine doctor and and hopefully hope hoping that someday I'd somehow be able to combine health policy and the work that I do, that I did, that I would do as a, as a doctor, because I saw a lot of primary care doctors doing wonderful, amazing work in health policy and health leadership. Um, but then I think it was my third rotation, uh, clinical rotation during medical school was, um, my surgery rotation. And as I was going to start that, I just, I just told my mom, mom, I'm just uh, so worried. Um, one, I hear that the surgeons are really mean <laughs> and I'm terrified about that. And, and two, I'm afraid of blood. So I don't know how I'm going to get through my surgery rotation. And my mom told me something that I'll never forget. She said, honey, don't worry about it. You just show up every single day. And, um, you show up and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you every single day. And all you have to do is just show up. And then don't worry about it. And so I was like, I don't know, but I'll, I'll show up. I don't have any other option. And, and the thing is, I forgot to be afraid of blood. I would, I would like jump in and, and volunteer to scrub into surgeries. And I, I remember um, in one case, Dr. Kevin Billingsley, who's just such an inspiration to me, is a, it was a colon cancer case. He, he let me uh, staple the bowel and, oh, I was just on cloud nine. And I just totally forgot to be afraid of blood. Um, and uh, so I, I fell in love with surgery, but I didn't really know if that was what I could do because I, I kind of didn't fit the picture of what a surgeon looked like. You know, I'm this small little Asian girl who's kind of shy and quiet and introvert and um, 
mostly when you think of a surgeon, you think of a big, tall man who's got a big, loud voice. And so I didn't really feel like I fit, fit into um, uh, what I typically see. Um, and, and also I wanted to be able to do health policy. And I honestly didn't know how you'd be able to fit that in along with a, a, a surgical career because I really hadn't seen many surgeons do that. And everyone had seen who'd been doing health policy was in pediatrics or primary care. Um, but, uh, you know, I prayed about it, I thought about it, and eventually I decided I'm just going to do what I love, and um, we'll see by the grace of God how things work out. And so I applied for surgery residency, and I went and started my surgical residency. And um, I think maybe this just shows you that I haven't really exactly planned out my career or my life, because things have happened, and I've just been so fortunate and blessed that they've happened in that way because each step of the journey has has been like a uh, a building block towards uh, what my my career eventually became but um during my uh during the was it the first or second year of uh, residency when I was in surgical residency all the residents are required to do two years of research all the chemical uh, surgery residents and uh, most of my classmates stayed at the medical center where I was at, and they did um, lab bench research. Um, uh, and I remember receiving this email, again, seeing this notice about this program. It was called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. And it was just like a few days before the deadline again. And I, I remembered back when I was uh, in Washington, D.C., working for Senator Tom Harkin as a Barbara Jordan health policy scholar. The program director for my program was this extraordinary woman, Cecilia Maxwell, who I just I just admired. I wanted to be just like Dr. Maxwell when I grew up. Um, Dr. Maxwell was vice president at Howard uh, Hospital. Um, she uh, was just this phenomenal phenomenal woman. She grew up in Panama, was born there, came to the United States, and um, as, as, a, as a teenager, um, went to college, became a nurse, and then became a doctor, and then had this phenomenal career um, in healthcare leadership. And she was just such a strong woman. I wanted to be just like her. Um, and I remember that she had done a program called the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship, where she spent um, a year working for Senator Tom Harkin um, on health policy uh, issues. And then, so now coming back to me being a, a resident in surgery residency and seeing this notice, I thought, wow, this is what Dr. Maxwell did. But actually it was a different program. <laughs> I, I didn't read the fine print. What Dr. Maxwell did was a health policy fellowship where she worked in the center's office. This program that I ended up applying for was a research uh, uh, fellowship where you do research and write research papers. So um, I applied for it under the mistaken impression that this is what my mentor did. And uh, I got accepted to the program at, uh, at the Yale site. Um, and um, the first year was really challenging because I didn't have a lot of research experience. Um, but by the second year, um, I kind of got my footing in. And it was, I think, the, that experience, the Yale program, I got my master's there in health policy, health services research. And it, it, those two years that I spent at Yale were, had a huge impact on my career. Um, we met, in addition to learning the fundamentals of research, which has been important in my career and for me to be able to be productive from an academic standpoint, um, I also got to meet amazing health policy leaders. Um, we met with the uh, FDA commissioner. We met with uh, White House health advisors. We, uh, we, we got to meet with a lot of amazing people um, who um, were shaping health policy. And one of the lessons I learned during my time at Yale is uh, to, to be able to dream big and to, to, to believe in the power of your dreams and to persevere. And um, the, those skills that I learned around health policy and healthcare management um, was hugely important in my career later. Um, so I'm happy and thankful for that mistake, though I, I don't really see it as a mistake. I've just seen so many times in my journey that um, God has had just such a incredible guidance in my life, and I feel blessed and grateful. So um, I did this two years at Yale, got my master's degree, and I came back and finished my surgical residency. And then when I finished my surgical residency, 
Um, I honestly wasn't sure how I was going to use all that stuff I learned at Yale and health policy because um, I, I wasn't sure how that was going to happen. But uh, I took my first job out of surgical residency at a tiny little town in uh, rural Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, and Shreveport has a, a, a VA medical center. We have a military base and we have a lot of casinos. Um, so um, that was that was a small town. And when I when I got there, um, the the medical center was actually close to shutting down its surgical service because it had such a high uh, rate of uh, mortality um, that was higher than what was expected based on the patient's comorbidities. They had also had a number of uh, adverse events, the things that we call never events like retained sponges, wrong site surgery, death from hemorrhage within uh, 24 hours, all the things that should not be happening but was happening. Um, and uh, I'm grateful for my, my mentor there at Shreveport when I started there, Dr. Ramon Romero. Um, uh, he was my boss uh, and uh, he, with his support, I um, founded a center for um, innovation in quality outcomes and patient safety. Um, when I founded it at the time, we had no funding. We had no FTEs. Uh, we just had a name. <laughs> and I thought it was important because it establishes the legitimacy, the, the, the importance of, um, of, of this work that we're doing. And everyone who was working on the work that we did was doing it voluntarily uh, as in addition to their full-time work as nurses, as doctors, as technicians, as clerks. And uh, we, we did a lot of work uh, around creating a culture of safety where anyone could speak up um, uh, during, uh, if there's a concern about safety. Uh, we worked along, a lot around creating multidisciplinary teams. And over the course of a year, we were able to reduce our surgical mortality by 66%. And we went from being an outlier for high mortality to being an outlier for low mortality. And this is after risk adjustment. Um, we also went from having multiple of those never events, those uh, wrong site surgery, uh, death from hemorrhage, to having zero. Um, and I, I, I like telling this story because I think it goes to demonstrate that um, the fundamentals matter. So even though I, I really did not love the fundamentals that we learned around public health and research and stuff like that, I was able to use those skills that I learned at Yale and to implement them in real time um, in a, a real situation where um, uh, we, we were able to, it was almost like having a, a live lab because we were able to implement all these strategies. So i um, grateful that I had that experience and that opportunity and that support from my, my leadership. Um, two years after that, um, I was uh, recruited by the Secretary of Health for the state of Louisiana to serve as um, the Chief Medical Officer for Louisiana Medicaid. Um, and that was just a wonderful experience. I, I love that. I was grateful for that. Um, Carrie, let me know if I'm running out of time. I'm trying to check the chat. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, when I started in that role, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know a whole lot about Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is a program that provides healthcare for pregnant women, uh, low-income women, um, Low income uh, for children, for elderly patients, low income elderly patients, disabled patients. And um, as a general surgeon, I, I didn't really do a lot of work around uh, pregnant women, children, but I, I, I feel like this was a good opportunity to put into practice all the skills that I learned at Yale, that I learned at OSU around having initiative and having leadership and, and learning on the job. And um, we did a lot of work that I'm very proud of. So going back to, as I mentioned, when I was uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. several years ago on that um, uh, program that I did through the, uh, that I applied as a result of the OSU EOP office, um, when I worked for Senator Tom Harkin, uh, writing the speech on the Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act, um, uh, that was actually uh, 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 a program that helped low-income women, particularly Medicaid women, um, have access to uh, not just diagnosis, but treatment of cervical cancer and breast cancer. And, and so now fast forward to when I was serving as chief milk officer for Louisiana Medicaid, 
Um, one of the things I'm very proud that we were able to accomplish and so thankful for my amazing team that made this possible is we were able to enable uh, uh, low-income women for the first time uh, to have uh, um, access to contralateral uh, breast surgery uh, with their breast cancer diagnosis and to have BRCA testing, um, which is hugely important uh, with breast cancer. Um, uh, another one of the things that we did is we tackled the opioid crisis. Um, you know, this was back in 2016. And at that time, um, uh, um, Louisiana had one of the highest rates of opioid uh, overdose deaths and opioid uh, prescriptions. We actually had more opioid prescriptions per capita uh, than people in the state. And that's including counting the babies and the children. And we did a lot of work around working with stakeholders, working with the community, educating and implementing regulations and rules around payment. And as a result, um, a year later, we were able to decrease uh, opioid prescriptions, new opioid prescriptions among Medicaid patients by 40%. And so proud of my team for, for being able to accomplish that. It's, I, I think that's where real change can happen. Um, Later, I was recruited back to the VA and uh, uh, to serve as Associate Chief of Staff at the Houston VA. It's one of the uh, most complex and one of the larger uh, VAs in the country. Um, love that experience. Um, actually came right before Hurricane Harvey. And um, uh, I, I'm just amazed at the resilience of people when, as we weathered through that storm. And we didn't just weather, we, we did well, we thrived during that. And I learned a lot about uh, leadership during crisis and crisis management as a result of that experience. Um, soon afterwards, I was recruited by the secretary of the VA to um, serve as special advisor to the secretary of the VA. Um, and uh, grateful for that experience. Uh, I got a chance to return back to Washington, DC and, and apply some of the skills I'd been spending the past several years of my career working on. Uh, one of the things Things that the VA chief of staff and the VA secretary tasked me to do was to look at um, employee engagement and uh, the, the challenge that uh, for several years, the VA at that time, uh, that was back in 2017, was ranked uh, 17th out of 18 federal agencies in terms of best places to work. So we weren't the worst, we were the second worst place to, to work for the ranking among federal agencies. Uh, and so um, uh, same thing, going back to the drawing board, we don't reinvent the wheel. There's the data out there which shows what are the things that impact employee engagement. Um, the research shows that um, the, the biggest impact on an employee is not the president, the CEO or the secretary, it's their frontline supervisor, the person that they report directly to. And that has the hugest impact on, on employees and how engaged they are. Um, and in addition, why does employee engagement matter? Well, the research shows that uh, uh, employee engagement uh, like among nurses has been directly correlated with uh, um, decreasing mortality among patients. It's employee engagement has better outcomes in healthcare. When you increase employee engagement, you have better outcomes and improved uh, quality of care for our patients. So that's why it's critically important to, to improve that. And so uh, grateful for so many of the amazing VA staff who are just um, committed to making VA one of the best places to work. Uh, literally, we, we, we had a meeting um, uh, where we brainstormed, we brought leaders from across the country from the different VA uh, uh, medical centers and visits and brainstormed and we came up, we drew, this is what our goal is. One day is to, see, we set our goals in one year to see um, on the New York Times uh, front page for it to say VA is the number one place to work at. Um, we didn't achieve that in one year, but in one year, we went from being the 17th out of 18 places to the sixth, sixth best place to work at. So incredibly proud of our VA. It's a combination of many things. We created a, a Frontline Supervisors Week. We created resources to empower our supervisors and to, to, to do a better job of, of uh, uh, leading in their, in their own communities with the, the staff that they work with. Um, and actually recently, just uh, this past year, VA was ranked by Forbes as one of the best places to work in the country. So um, I, 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 
I think that that goes to show the power of uh, um, believing your dreams, believing in the people, believing in the power of change, um, and that change is absolutely possible. It, it's it's we've seen real results, we've seen real change, and I'm so proud of our VA and our our staff for what they've accomplished. Um, uh, later during my time in DC, I was uh, appointed as a uh, uh, as nominated and appointed as deputy undersecretary uh, for health for community care, which oversees uh, care that veterans receive outside of the VA network. Um, and uh, grateful for that opportunity. And uh, I, I learned so much during my time in Washington DC. And then I um, returned back to Houston, and now I work in the Houston VA, and I care for veterans there. I pretty much spent most of my career taking care of veterans and low income uh, patients. And um, I, I don't think it was a conscious decision I made. I think that I've just been so fortunate, you know, when I was uh, in that refugee camp and injured and my mom was dying, we were the one of the most vulnerable. We were low income, we, we were destitute, and um, we. Um, were, are alive today because of the people who are able to, who are willing to help and had the compassion, the kindness to do that. So I, I think it kind of comes full circle. And um, I guess the the parting lessons would be that um, I haven't, you know, planned out my career to be this way. I've been so grateful to go from a refugee camp to being a doctor to to being able to operate on patients to being able to lead, you know, on the state and national level and um, it just shows you what an amazing country we live in and what amazing people compose this thing we call humanity. We, there are so many amazing people. Um, so I'm gonna pause. That was a lengthy uh, description of my, my journey and give you all a chance to ask all the questions that you want to ask. Yeah, so let me, let me get this on. So how the Q&A session will work is that you guys can raise your hand and we will call on you or you can type in the chat as well. And then me and Ella can read it out. And then Dr. Shiryam Kui can answer your questions like right now, if you would like. So yeah, and also um, just letting everyone know in advance, we will be mixing some of our own questions as well, but you will of course have time to um, ask your questions. So let's go with an easy one, you know, Cambodian people, we love food, for example. So what is your favorite Cambodian dish to eat and why? I think that's a very appropriate question, Carrie, because anytime a bunch of Cambodians get together, there's going to be a lot of food. That's just like what we do. We love, we love to eat and we love to enjoy delicious food. So, um, the, the food that I love, I love Man Chao. Um, for those who might not be familiar with uh, uh, Cambodian cuisine, Man Chao is actually something that's prevalent in a lot of Southeast Asian cuisine. It's a, it's a, it's a made with rice flour. It looks almost like a, I don't know, like a crepe, but it's savory and filled with like, like shrimp or pork and bean sprouts and they eat with tons and tons of vegetables and herbs, like a huge platter of vegetables and herbs. And it's so delicious. Um, I also love um, uh, Man Hoi, which is like this uh, uh, very thin angel hair noodle. Um, also eaten with tons of vegetables. We, we, we usually eat a lot of fresh vegetables, uh, a lot of herbs like basil and mint and cucumbers and lettuce or salad and it's it's delicious but what I really crave when I'm homesick when is my mom's uh salaka go which is a uh, it just like hits the spot when you're when you're away from home. It's this it's, it's this very hearty soup, almost like a stew, and it's got like a hundred different vegetables in there. It's uh it's 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 got a base of what we call krung, which is lemongrass that's been ground up with a lot of fragrant aromatic um, uh, stuff like uh, kaffir lime leaves and garlic. And so that's a base that's used in a lot of Khmer cuisine. And then it's got tons and tons of uh, vegetables from uh, uh, the lag, which uh, I don't know what the English uh, name for that is. Uh, it's a uh, eggplant. Uh, and, and in Cambodian cuisine, there's like 10 million different types of eggplants. You know, you got small ones, the big ones, the little bunches. Uh, uh, it's got uh, bamboo shoots. It's got green papaya. It's got, uh, you could put like, uh, what is that? Uh, 
bitter melon, bitter melon leaves, get, put spinach. Ah, oh, it's you're making me hungry. <laughs> I'm making myself hungry. Um, so van chao, van hoi, slakako. Basically, anything my mom makes is delicious. Except bahol. I'm gonna be honest. I do not like bahol. Bahol is like this fermented fish that is used in tons of Southeast East Asian food, and my mom loves it, and I unfortunately don't. <laughs> but um, uh, that's that's my mom. <laughs> That's so funny because like Prahok is like it's like known as like the Cambodian it such is. a Cambodian thing. It's in everything. And, yeah, you can't escape from it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just like reading the comments, you know, it's just I was getting hungry too. You know, I miss my mom's food. Like whenever I'm at OSU, she has to like bring up so much Cambodian food, like <laughs> no machok and those type of things. And That's yeah, what just Cambodian <laughs> parents do. They just like stock your refrigerator because they're worried that you're gonna starve or something. <laughs> That, that, yeah, that's pretty much how it is. But yeah, that I love. I'm like salivating now <laughs> thinking about that. <laughs> Eric asks, what about duck prahok with steak? <laughs> so. I'll say that again. Duck uh, prahok. Oh, let's say, uh, my mom would probably love that. <laughs> um, for, for me, it's my... Uh... I live with my grandmother along with my parents and she's the one who cooks for us. And currently I'm on a journey to learn how to cook those foods. So, <laughs> um, cause I miss it so much. Is there, is there anything that you like to cook? Well, I'm not a very good cook. I'm gonna <laughs> be honest. My, uh, my mom does not look like, like my cooking and I don't like my cooking either. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can make some name. Cause that's like basic. That's just like just slicing up vegetables and rolling it up. Name is uh, uh, the fresh uh, spring rolls. Um, uh, and uh, that's like, it's not even cooking, <laughs> but I can make that. Does anyone else have more questions for Dr. Oh, hello, Jason. Do you have any questions for Dr. Kui? You raised your hand. Sure. So hi, I'm Jason, a fellow Cambodian and second year pharmacy student. First of all, Dr. Kui, uh, I would like to thank you for being here and gifting us your experiences. Um, healthcare isn't a common field that people associate with like Cambodians, especially our ethnicity and let alone the surgery field. Uh, for the, from the past 30 minutes, it sounds like your career path was pretty successful with all your achievements in the VA hospital and like making it out of Cambodia. Um, and, you know, being who you are today, did you by any chance experience some um, imposter syndrome in your journey to become where you are now, uh, especially being the first one to walk down the path of first female Cambodian surgeon, you know, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about like, if you like felt like you couldn't do it at certain times, or if it wasn't like the right field for you, um, share your thoughts. So first off, Jason, I think it's wonderful that you're going into pharmacy. Pharmacists are so important. I call them all the time and they catch, you know, the, the, those uh, doses that are, uh, and they prevent a lot of methyl errors. So the, the work that y'all as pharmacists do is extremely important. So that's great that you're going to there. Yeah, I thank you. I, so twofold. Um, uh, uh, one, the question about the imposter syndrome, absolutely. I think a lot of people feel that way. People who uh, come from, I guess, uh, I don't know, underprivileged backgrounds, whether it's because you're a minority, whether because you're a woman, whether it's because of your socioeconomic background, we oftentimes aren't used to seeing people in those roles. So to see yourself there when no one else at the, the, at the table looks that way, um, it, 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 it's, it's normal to feel that way, but um, you shouldn't let it hold you back. I, uh, I, I think that I've, I've been in many boardrooms where I look around and I'm, golly, I'm the only one with this face, but um, uh, you get to the point where you just don't even think about it. You instead think about what a privilege it is that I get to be here at the table and I should do everything I can to help others, to help others be able to get there, to have a voice there, a seat there, and to help others have the opportunities that I have and to help change the system. So uh, when you do get there, which you will, you will, I absolutely believe you all, everyone here will, will get there, use, use that opportunity to make it better for others. Uh, the second thing is, um, 
I know there's two parts to your question, Jason. I forgot the first part. Uh, I was thinking it, about it. It's like, basically under the imposter syndrome. Oh, oh so yeah, like, yeah. I'm not seeing basically... a lot of Kamei in, uh, in health care. Um, uh, one, I've been very blessed to have an amazingly supportive mother. You know, I'm grateful. My mom uh, worked like two to three jobs, working as a housekeeper, uh, cleaning toilets uh, on her days off at people's houses, uh, doing all the horrible work. You know, she'd go, uh, do all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm so proud of her, but she was so supportive every time. Like she, uh, uh, she she's just always there. I, I remember when I was at OSU, I, I, I worked in a lab and I, I wanted to be able to uh, advance the project really fast. I'd even go in at midnight to change the gel phoresis and my mom would drive me there even though she's working full-time two jobs so because she didn't feel it was safe for me going there. She, like that's how supportive my mom was so that I could like, you know, get my project done and I'm grateful and I owe it to that. Um, in terms of uh, uh, not many may being at that point, I think that um, that may be the history, but I'm hoping being that that's not the future. Uh, for me, um, like like I said, I didn't see myself as being a surgeon because I was so scared and I thought all the surgeons were mean people and they'd yell at you. And and like my mom said, you just show up every single day. If you, if you, if this is your dream, your passion, I didn't know it was my dream back then. She just made me show up. She said, just show up and I will pray for you. And then I forgot to, to be afraid and forgot to be scared. Um, and, and I wasn't always that way. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, very small, very shy, very quiet, but I think you hopefully get to the point where one day you don't remember those things and you just remember to focus on what you're passionate about, focus on what your dreams are and don't listen too much to what other people say. Um, I would say that a lot of times when people are at a certain point in their career, you oftentimes hear about all the accomplishments. Like I talked about how we got, you know, decreased uh, opioid prescriptions by 40%. We decreased Mortality, but we oftentimes don't talk about the failures and the challenges. And there are many failures and there are many challenges. Um, I during residency is tough. Surgical residency is tough. But I tell everyone, so if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, look at me. If I can do it, you can do it. And I, I spent many years crying almost every day during residency. But um, you don't let people hold you back. I, um, I, I, I remember. I, I remember that there are uh, situations where um, people weren't encouraging or actively uh, discouraging. Uh, uh, I, I hate talking about the negative. I love talking about all the people who've blessed me, who've helped me, who've supported me, encouraged me so much. You know, I, I love talking about the names like Lonnie Roberts and the philosophy department, who was such an amazing mentor, such an advocate. These are the people I love to talk about. But, you know, I had experiences where I... Um, went to ask for just a form to uh, give to someone to write a letter of recommendation to apply for medical school. And uh, I wasn't asking that person for the letter of recommendation, I was asking them for the form. And they, they remember, I hate talking about this stuff because it's not the thing I want to magnify, but I remember them saying that, uh, that it was a waste of paper. And um, uh, I, 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 I remember just standing there and crying, but I wouldn't leave until I got that darn form. I was not going to leave until I got it. And I got it. I went and asked my professor to write the recommendations for me. And by the grace of God, I got to be into again to medical school. But I think one, when you see those who are ahead of you, who have, you know, gone to whatever points in their careers, we've all had challenges. Um, it's just that, um, for me, I love to magnify and talk about the people who have helped me because um, I love sharing the strategies so that it inspires others to help others. Um, but uh, I, I guess my word of wisdom to you would be, don't let other people's words hold you back. Believe in your dreams, go for it. And um, I know that you can do it. To shift things to a lighter note, can you teach us a word in Khmer? Oh, I speak horrible Khmer. My mom laughs at me all the time. She's like, my golden She's a, it's a, I, I, you know, I came to the United States when I was three and a half. I grew up in Corvallis. There's like, you know, 
five or six Khmer people, maybe 10 Khmer people. Um, uh, there's more when you got to OSU because you have the Cambodian Student Association there. So I spoke English through most of my career, but uh, uh, you know, I can speak the basics. You can, I can say, 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 I'm hungry, I can clean why, but uh, I, I can't speak it well, though. Um, I, I definitely encourage all young Khmer to uh, to embrace the heritage and to try to remember your language because it's a huge part of your your history. All right, thank you. I also cannot speak Khmer that well, so you are not alone, Dr. Kui. And kind of related to that, like connecting with our culture, how do you stay connected to your culture as an adult and as a professional, like? How do you maintain that? Do you like, you know, call your mother often speaking Khmer? Do you just eat a lot of Khmer food? Like, how do you, how do you do that? Um, I think you remember your roots uh, and it's in the values that you grew up with. And um, as you go through your life and your journey, you learn more and you, you know, embrace all those other things you learn. But at the very core, I'm, I'm Cambodian American. I, I got no throat Khmer. That's, that's my, my, that's, that's who I am, and so it's the food that I eat. It's the, it's the 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 uh, what is it? Pig Latin, pig Khmer. I speak, um, but it, it's just your whole identity and the the values you grew up with. You know the values that my my ma, uh, taught me, which is to honor and respect your elders. Uh, uh, to Khmer culture has is a history of a. Of, of hospitality. Anyone come to your house un, unannounced, uninvited, you spread out, you make a huge dinner for them. It's, it's that whole sense of hospitality. Anytime you show up to any Khmer's house, they're, they're just feeding you. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I think those values are, um, th they just stay with you hopefully throughout your life. Um, then there's always ways that you can try to support and to give back. Like this morning, I was speaking at the Khmer Health Forum uh, in Long Beach, which is where we have a large Khmer population. Uh, there's a wonderful organization there that uh, seeks to tap into the wonderful resource of Khmer doctors, dentists, pharmacists, social workers, educators, and um, they do a lot of work around teaching the community there. And uh, uh, and I, I spoke at their forum and I, I speak at many of those other things. Uh, there's, a, there's a Cambodian health a Cambodian American, I said CHAPAC, which is Cambodian American Healthcare Professionals Association, um, and they do uh, uh, they they do a lot of mission trips to uh, Sarawak Khmer every year, and um, I, I speak at their galas and their their meetings. Um, uh, I, I think any opportunity you can find in small or big ways to um, give back to your community to help others to to um, give a hand because many of us have benefited so much from others who have given us a hand. That is like, thank you. Like that is like, honestly, what I need to hear as someone who is kind of afraid of growing up to be honest and going to grad school and those type of things. Like how, how am I gonna like still stay connected with my culture? Like if I move away for grad school, for example, like away from my family. So those type of things, like what you just said is like perfect for me. Thank you. That's like. So nice to hear. You will be just fine, Carrie. You will turn out <laughs> just fine. You're doing Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask if anyone else had some more questions for Dr. Kui. Just you can type it in chat. Raise your hand if you would like. If not, oh, Jenny, hello. You can type it or say it. Oh, Hi, I was, Jenny. Hello. I was just guessing like, How's, how are you doing over there? Or how's it like being the front line? Uh, thank you for asking, Jenny. I appreciate that. Um, Houston has had a huge uh, COVID surge in the South Southern uh, states. We've, we've had a huge surge. Fortunately, things are peaking, uh, have peaked and starting to trend down, but we've had, this is our fourth peak of uh, the COVID surge. Um, uh, gosh, I, uh, I think every healthcare worker, whatever role you're in, from being a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, social worker, the janitor cleaning the hospital and keeping it clean, everyone involved, I think, feels tired. Um, I don't think anyone expected it to be almost two years now 
um, you know, when we look back to March 2020, we, we thought we were going into the lockdown for two weeks. I thought maybe a month this would uh, be over. But um, despite all that, I'm just so amazed by the resilience of people and the, the compassion. I remember um, during those early days when we didn't have a vaccine yet, when PPE was scarce, um, when uh, there were so many unknowns about the virus. I, I was in the OR locker room changing after a, a case, but um, uh, I remember seeing this uh, 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 maintenance uh, or, staff member just like wiping down all the surfaces in the locker room with disinfected wipes and i just said no thank you for doing that and and she said um it's my job i'm doing what i can to keep our veterans safe and and that 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 attitude of wow that um everyone's doing their part to help um that's that's just it just it's heartwarming it makes you feel good when you see that and it it makes you have hope um for for our humanity but, but thank you for asking, Jenny. Thank you so much for everything you do, like volunteering your time to do this when you are literally, you could be on call right now. Like you could, you are like on the front line as a surgeon and everything you do is amazing. Like even you said you were like afraid of blood, right? But you're still doing it. So I don't know how you're doing this. I can't believe it. It's it's amazing what you're doing. And um, I noticed that it is getting, it is past a little bit too, but I just wanted to ask if anyone has really quick last questions for Dr. Kui by any chance. So let's wait a little bit. Oh, Jenny. It's just kind of personal, but I was wondering um, if you know this person, do you know Ming Lai Ho? I'm gonna be honest, I'm not good with Khmer names. I just <laughs> always say Chiri of Suo Min, Chiri of Suo Fu, and I don't yeah. even know most of the people's names. I'm so sorry, but uh, please sell, Tell me like, oh, I said, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a bad Cambodian daughter. I, oh. um, I, I don't, I never remember all the aunties and uncles names. It says like, um, my dad told me that something about how I borrowed your, your desk from you. Oh, really? Oh, well, <laughs> cool, Jenny. Then we, we must know each other. <laughs> I don't know. He told me you're my aunt or something. I'm like, oh. Oh, oh wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't know that, Jane, but nice to meet you. And that's wonderful that now you're at OSU too. Uh, what year are you now, Jenny? Huh? Oh, uh, first What year. year are you now, Jenny? Oh, wow. First yeah. year. Well, congratulations. Oh, I'm also with my dad right now. Oh, well, if your dad's there, tell him I said hi. Okay. She says so much. Hi. Hi, Jay. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell your dad thank you. Oh, wow. Just see it's us a like. Small world. I know. It's a I small mean, small world. That's very true. I feel like with all Cambodian people were like, oh, I'm like their aunt or something, or like, that's my niece. But they're like, I don't know, like, they were just born. It was just weird. It's just weird Cambodian lives. I don't know. A lot of us are related because we come from these very small villages and in these like, yeah, which is where my mom is, like, everyone is a third cousin or a fifth cousin. So mm -hmm. um, I could be related to y'all too, for all I know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So with the, we just want to ask, do you have any last words before we kind of like close it, of course, um, well, like for us as, you know, before you leave us forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, our, our vice president is actually related to like Jason, too. So that's oh. proof that like we're all weirdly related. But, that's okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Do you have any well, last well, words? <laughs> absolutely. Well, for one, it's a, it's a country, you know, what? seven million people so it's like the size of one state so it's a uh, but um first off thank you so much for for inviting me carrie and uh all the members of the cambodian student association and wonderful to see janet and uh every everyone here um uh, i guess my parting words are um i'm proud of you guys you are the dream of your parents and your grandparents who who went through so much for you to be here um you know they they 
escape through landmines to 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 come to the United States. And so you are the hope and the dream of many. And and wear that with confidence. Wear that with pride. And and go after your dreams. Don't let anything hold you back. Know that you can do it. Thank you, Dr. Kui Akun, so much. <laughs> but um, we would like to yeah. <laughs> we would like to take a little group photo, even though it's a little small, but you know, with our little faces and post it somewhere that like we had Dr. Sheram Kui come with us to talk to us. So um, if people could please show their face, if not, it's okay if you're uncomfortable, but we would love to have a little photo remember this. So Eric will be taking it. So Eric, just let us know when you're ready. Oh, I think I'm waiting for Dylan's camera. It's all black right now. I don't know if he's <laughs> going to get it on. Oh, there he is. Hello. All right. I'll be taking the photo. Three, two, one. Okay. Looks good. Yay. <laughs> yeah. It's so nice to see everyone's beautiful faces again. But um, Dr. Kui, we do have a little, a little surprise for you. So Eric, if you could share your screen. Yep, just give me a second and save the photo. Here it is. <laughs> we made a little gym word for everyone Aww. who attended to kind of thank you. Well, I'll share this with you through email as well so you could see this um, oh, more this in beautiful. person. But there's like wow, you, messages. You made this so fast, Eric. You guys are really, <laughs> wow. You young people amaze me. So that's <laughs> cool. Wow, this is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it, it was good to be back home. <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope that one day you could come in person. That'd be like the dream, of course. But um, we understand how the struggles of being the front line on, through COVID and we, oh. we, we want you to be safe and healthy throughout these times. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. I think I got Henry's camera was just turning on. Can we retake the photo? <laughs> okay. Can we can retake the photo. Right. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Hey, there you go. <laughs> That's the beauty of CSA. We, we, we can make, you know, adjust really fast. <laughs> Flexible. Yes, yes. Slightly chaotic, but you know, flexible. A good chaotic. <laughs> good chaotic. <laughs> Best version. But uh, yeah, this will be the end of our talk. If any of you guys have any questions to Dr. Kui, you can send them to me. I can write down my email and then I'll send them to her and I can give you a response as well from that. So let me put down my email right here. And this will be posted on YouTube with captions as well. So if you couldn't make most of it or you want to share it with your friends, it'll be on there. So don't worry. It'll be here forever. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kui. Thank you. Thank Akon. you, everyone. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Goodbye. Bye.